Welcome once again, everybody, to the Undiscovered Games video podcast, where we take a look at the lesser-known board games of the world and share those with you. Today, we're going back to 2009 with a beautiful, classic, old-school-style Euro game called World Without End. Now, if the box looks familiar, that's because this is the sequel to The Pillars of the Earth, which is a very popular worker placement game that's been around for a long time. So World Without End came second in the trilogy, followed by A Column of Fire. These are all based on Ken Follett's Kingsbridge novels. And if you've ever read those books, let me know in the comments below. I would love to know how well the games tie into the books. I've never read them, so I can't speak to the thematic tie-in, but I can speak to the gameplay. This is by Michael Renick and Stefan Stadler. Two to four players. It's a medium to slightly heavier Euro style board game. And you're going to be doing all sorts of things like collecting resources to build out on the board or gaining loyalty to the king so you don't have to pay your taxes or collecting medical knowledge so you can heal the sick during the plague. It has beautiful artwork by Michael Menzel, one of my favorite board game artists, and I could honestly frame this board and put it up on my wall. It's just that beautiful. This game has all those old school flavors that I love in board games. I could play these types of games all the time. This game centers around two core mechanisms that I really enjoy. First, you're gonna be orienting these diamond-shaped cards in such a way that everyone at the table gets some sort of a bonus, but you, as the active player, get a little extra something. So if you've ever played the game Puerto Rico, this kind of reminds me of that a little bit where you have to decide what everybody gets and then you get a little bonus as well. There's also card play in the game, which I love. You have these action cards. The catch is every time you play an action card, you also have to discard an action card. So in each round of the game, you're only gonna get to play half of your cards at best. And as you can imagine, that leads to some incredibly agonizing decisions. And I just love this part of the game. There's also gonna be these building projects that randomly come out on the board throughout the game. And I just love how these fit perfectly onto the board. There's a spot for each project and that just adds a nice visual appeal to the game. There's also gonna be houses that fall ill to the plague and you can use your medical knowledge to heal them. And of course, you can't do whatever you want. You're gonna to have to pay these duties at the end of each round. So this kind of keeps you in check like a lot of great Euro games do. Let's look at the setup. First, you're gonna find these cards that are numbered and you're gonna place them face up in order at the top of the board. One, two, three, and four. Then you're gonna take the corresponding deck for each number, shuffle those up, and then you're gonna deal six of these cards to the stack at the top of the board. Now these cards are gonna track the progress of the game. So you're gonna set them here, offset them a little bit from that face up card so you can see when you're getting near the end of the round. And each era is gonna last, you guessed it, six rounds. So each card is a round, each era is six rounds. There's four eras in the game. So if you do the math, you're gonna get 24 turns total in this game. So you're gonna offset it like that, leave a little gap in the middle there because we're gonna put a tower project up there just to remind us. So you're gonna find this tower piece and set it between eras two and three at the top. Find the plague tokens, these little black circles, mix those up and place them next to the tower. This is just gonna remind us to put these out on the board when we get to that point in the game. And then you can take the rest of the building projects and just set those off to the side for now. Find the little black marker and place it on the third space of this favor track on the outlaws space. Take one brown X and cover up the cloth market, the red one there, not the white one. Cover up the red one. That's off limits the first round of the game. And then fill in the spots on the board. Forrest gets the brown cubes, Corey gets the gray cubes, and the field gets these cool little wheat tokens. You're also going to have some cloth and wool wooden resources over here on the side of the board, as well as your coins and your medical books and your loyalty crowns. All this, just put it within reach of the board. The piety tokens go over here in the cathedral and all this other stuff, just keep it close by. Once you determine a start player, give them this start player token, and then everybody gets a deck of action cards. There's 12 cards in each deck, and they're color-coded on the back for the player colors, and every deck is identical. Every player gets the exact same 12 cards, and once everybody has those decks, I want to draw your attention to this little diamond in the top of the board here. 
the game suggests sitting top, down, left, and right from each other. Now, if you don't have a square table, that's hard to do. So what I like to do is take a cube from another game in each player color and put it on each corner of the diamond in player order, the way you're sitting around the table. This will make that section much easier to visualize. You'll see that in a minute. Now you're gonna take your scoring marker for each player and place it on the number eight section of the score track. Everybody starts out with eight points. And then each player also gets two donation seals in their color as well as four houses in their color. Finally, give each player one wool and two coins to hide behind their screens. Everybody starts with the same stuff. You just wanna keep it hidden behind your player screen here. And one final thing, find the bridge building project. It looks like this. Place that on the appropriate spot on the board. And now you're ready to play World Without End. Now this is what the board should look like at the beginning of the game. This is the initial setup of the game. And it's a little bit of a task to set the game up, but once you play it once, it's really not bad. The rule book lays it out very nicely as well. And now I kind of want to show you just how the game plays briefly. Once you see one round, you'll understand it completely. There's four eras in the game, once again, marked by these stacks of cards. After we play two of the eras, this tower project just gets put out onto the board into the cathedral, and also the plague tokens up there, these little black circles, those come out onto the board as well, and the plague will start infecting the town. So let's say the green player is the start player. They're going to draw the top event card, and we are in era one here, so they're gonna draw the top card, and they're gonna read the text. This is going to be an event that affects everybody. So this card says each player may trade one wool for three gold, and you'd all do that right now. You decide. Then you look in the corners of the card. Now, as the active player, I have to orient this card in such a way that every player at the table is going to receive whichever symbol is pointing at their cube. And you really have to weigh how you're going to help your opponents during this phase of the game. And every card has a different mix of symbols. Also, every card has a little red arrow. And you see how there's these symbols in between the cubes. That's what the arrow points at, and that will move this favor track in a clockwise fashion at the bottom of the board. It just goes in a circle like this, and that's gonna be your personal bonus as the active player. So you not only have to think about how you're helping you and the other players with the resources on the corners, but where that arrow points is gonna give you a personal bonus from that bottom track. And not every spot on that track is good either. It's also worth noting if you point the arrow at zero and the track does not move, you do not get a bonus. So let's just say I want that wool. So I'm gonna orient this so it points at the three and I can get that later. But first we divvy out the bonuses on the corner. So green gets a coin, put these behind your screen. Blue gets a point tracked along the outside of the board. Red over there gets a gray cube, which is stone. Again, these go behind your player boards, keep all this stuff hidden. And yellow gets a wheat from the field. I love these little wooden wheat tokens. Once you get those, then you move the little rondelle based on where that arrow is. So we're gonna move this one, two, three spots, and I immediately collect a wool. And again, these are really cool wooden resources. Love that. So let's go over what these spots mean. This just means collect one piety from the cathedral. This next spot here is actually a bad spot, and there's two of those outlaws. You're going to lose a coin if it lands on those. Next is going to be one point per house that you have built. Next, you're going to get two points if you have any books in your possession at all. So if you have any books, it's just two points. Next is collect wool. Next, you're going to get a point per loyalty crown that you have, one point per. Next, you're going to collect wheat. Then you're going to collect a point per piety that you have. You don't have to spend this stuff. You just have to show that you have it. Two points if you have any of those. It's kind of like the book thing up there. You just have to have some. You get two points. And then we're back to the start. So that's just what those symbols mean. Now, after everybody collects their goodies, we're going to move on to the action cards. Now, each player in turn order is going to play one of their 12 action cards. They're pretty easy to understand. This one here says move the favor track forward one and get the bonus. Pretty simple. Next card here is take one stone or one wood. Pretty easy. Next card here, take one piety. Once again, very easy to understand. Take a piety token from the cathedral. Next, we have the take a grain from the field. Again, this stuff is very simple. Privilege card lets you play 
the last action that you played again. So that one's kind of interesting. Now the building project card is a great way to get points in this game. You can contribute two resources for three points each. Right now we only have the bridge to build on and that requires five stone. But later in the game, more of these building projects will come out. And notice how some of the squares are brown and some are gray. That just means, you know, wood or stone have to go on those spots. And you can contribute using that building project card to get some big points throughout the game. But remember, anybody can contribute to these, so you're gonna be fighting with each other to contribute those and get those big points. Now, wool and cloth sales lets you sell any amount of wool and or one cloth for the money shown. Now, starting out the game, you can only sell wool. We have the cloth market marked off. That will come off later. But right now, we could sell our wool for two money each, and that would be four money starting out. That would not be a bad first turn. So that's just another option there. The medicine card, you can only use the bottom because no one's sick yet, but the bottom says you just get a point and a coin. Later, you can use the top. Building a house, there's a small typo on this card. It says pay one gold and either one wool or one stone. It should say one wood or one stone. As you can see where you build houses over here, you're only going to pay wood or stone, whatever's showing there. So you don't pay wool to build a house. That doesn't make sense. So just learn that typo and remember it. Now it's worth noting when you build a house, you can never monopolize a single area. You see how there's these groups of two that give out the same benefit, like two coins or two points. So you can never have your two of your same color house in one of those areas and like monopolize the wheat, for instance. You, that's not allowed. You can only have one house in each section. Now, once your houses are built, you have to play the house rent card and collect the bonus that your house gets you. So let's say we have three houses built. They have a bonus at the top of each. You're only allowed to collect two of those three bonuses, and that's what the house rent card lets you do. You get to pick which two you get. Donation is a fun card. You pay one coin, and you get to put one of your donation seals on a building project that's not finished yet. And this is kind of a fun way to capitalize off of other people's work. So if I donate to this, once these bricks get filled in, I will get the bonus down here at the bottom. Now, multiple players can donate to this project as well, but I don't have to contribute a single stone to that to get the reward. And each building project that comes out is going to have a different reward for people who donate to it. And that adds a really nice player interaction um, as you all donate to each other's projects. The projects come out based on the event card, so you never know which projects will be available in a given game. But that's just another subtle layer that I really like in this game. The last card's very simple. Cloth production lets you turn one or two wool into one or two cloth, and that's all the action cards. So on your turn, you get to play a card and discard a card. Remember that. You have 12 cards, but you're only going to get to play half of them. So let's just say I want to play the building material card here to collect a resource. So I play that, and I immediately either take a wood from the forest, or I could get a stone from the quarry. So I'm going to take a stone, put it behind my screen. Now I have to immediately discard a card. This is where the game gets so good. If you've ever played Bruges, it kind of reminds me of that where you want to use all your cards for everything, but you can only use a portion of them. And this is by far my favorite part of this game because the decision of which card to play and which card to discard gets harder and harder and harder as the game builds. Every card becomes more and more valuable to you and you can only use half of them. It's just so good. So once every player has played one card and discarded one card, you pass the start player token to your left and that player becomes the new active player who then draws the next event card off the stack. They're going to do the same thing all over again. They're going to read the text. Everybody's going to react to the text. Then they're going to position the card so everybody gets a bonus and so on. Now notice how this card has a blue border around it. The blue cards stay in effect the entire era of the game. So we're in era one. So until all those era one cards run out, this blue card will stay in effect for the entire round. Now that could be good or bad depending on which event you draw. So I like that the game forces you to react to these events. Some players might not like that random event element to the game, but I like that it, it makes you, you know, stay on your toes. You can't just have a straight strategy from beginning to end. You have to be able to adapt. And whoever adapts the best is going to do well in the game. 
Now, I mentioned earlier paying duties at the end of each era. So once a stack of cards runs out, you're going to owe what's showing here. You're going to owe two piety, two grain, and then we're going to roll one die to figure out how much we owe in taxes. If you cannot pay these, you're going to be punished severely. You definitely want to pay your duties. Now, you could earn loyalty crowns, and you can spend a loyalty crown to basically take care of one of your duties. So one crown would cover each one of these. And you could spend three crowns basically to avoid paying anything. Now let's fast forward to the end of the first era. So all the event cards have been played. Now we're just going to read this face up card and do what it says. It says place one resource onto each building project. Some of those might get completed in that process. Then we're going to remove from the game all these X tiles, and we're going to remove all the long-term blue event cards. And finally, we're going to pay our duties, our mandatory costs. If you can't pay those, you're going to suffer the consequence. Or again, you can give up your loyalty to pay for those. If you can't pay your duties, it's brutal. If you don't have enough piety, you're going to lose three points per piety you don't have, and you have to undergo penance, which means your opponent randomly chooses your discard for the first round of the next chapter. If you can't pay your wheat, you're going to lose two points per wheat, and then you have to beg, and you cannot receive your personal income from these, these cards the first round next time. If you can't pay your taxes, it's minus a point per coin, and you go to the royal court, which causes you to lose your first action card of the next round. You still have to play the card, you just ignore it, so it's a waste. Punishing, punishing things if you cannot pay those. Let's go to the end of era two. This tower project comes out onto the board, remember, down here by the cathedral. And that's just going to be another building project that everyone can contribute to. And I will talk about that blue resource here at the top in just a second. Then at the end of era two, you're also going to seed the board with these circular plague tokens. And you don't want to look at the underside of them, but each house has a little circle spot. And you're going to put one plague randomly on each house. And these houses are going to start to get sick and you're going to be able to heal them in the next round of the game. So let's say it's the start of the next round, which would be era three. Now these cards are going to show which houses fall ill to the plague. So there's this little number here. That's just which house you flip over. So you look for house number five, flip over the plague token, and that just says you need three medical knowledge to heal that house. So in that case, we would need to have three books in our possession and then play the medicine card to heal that that house. You don't spend your books, you just have to have them. You could even cure multiple houses with one medicine card if you have enough medical knowledge. So if I had this, I could play this medicine card. If I had five books in my stash, then I could cure both of those houses in one turn. And each house gives you a bonus plus two points. So if you cure that house or that house, you get the bonuses plus two points for each house. So those medical books can be huge in the second half of the game. You get two points for each house plus bonuses. That is a powerful, powerful card if you invest in medical knowledge early on in the game. After you heal the houses, the tokens come off the board and those houses no longer get sick. So there's a little bit of a race to heal the sick as well in this game. Let's say I'm about to complete this tower project here. Let's show you how this works. So I have to play the building project card, and that lets me contribute up to two resources to a single project, again, for three points each. So I'm going to contribute one stone and one wood. Now on this project, when this happens, you evaluate who has the most loyalty to the king, so the most crowns. They get to take the blue metal resource and place it on the top and finish the project, and that's just worth another three points. But that project is a little bit different in that regard. Again, players who donate are going to get the reward, so if, if yellow and red donated to that, they would also get the bonus reward at the bottom. But that's how that tower project is slightly different. You check for loyalty to get that blue resource. 
Now let's look at this house area again. Now with four players, I love this section of the board because everyone's fighting over these spots. There's only two, you know, bonus resources of each type and everyone's going to fight over those. Now with two players, that's not quite as good, but the game plays pretty well at all player counts still. I just love the interaction when you get four players. Everyone's competing to build on these building projects and there's just a, there's a nice tension there between everybody at four players. So again, it's a pretty standard Euro game. You're doing a lot of different things to get points. There's some interaction. There's some punishing moments. There's a little bit of randomness, but there's still ways to adapt to that. I really like how this game does it. It's pleasant to look at. It's got a very streamlined design. The rule book could be written a little bit better, I think, but for the most part, it's very easy to understand. And I would highly recommend if you like these older style Euro games. Now I wanna show you the very last part. So once this last deck runs out, notice here, if you can't pay your mandatory costs, you're gonna lose double the victory points. So instead of those penalties, you lose twice as many victory points if you can't pay the last round. Finally, at the end, your resources that you haven't used are one point, and gold is worth a half a point. Now, that's important. You don't round up or down. So if you end up with seven gold, you get three and a half points. That could be the difference in breaking ties. That's kind of a little interesting twist at the end of the game as well. So World Without End, I hope that gives you kind of an idea of how it plays. I don't know if I covered every little rule, but I think I did pretty well. This track here um, sometimes gets covered up with these X tokens. And if that ever happens, you're just gonna skip over them. So you don't count that toward your movement. So that's one little rule I missed. Another minor rule is when you divvy out these bonuses from these cards, your resource stock is limited. So if you cannot take a wheat, for instance, you instead get a point. And that's kind of neat to analyze that because sometimes those resources do run out over there. So I think I covered all the rules for the most part. I definitely recommend reading the rule book if you get this game, but I kind of wanted to just show you how the game played while I reviewed it a little bit and talked about it. So hopefully you have an understanding now about World Without End and if it's one you would want to check out. So I have to rate this game a 9 out of 10. There's just not a lot I don't like about it. I like the decisions with the card play, you know, how you orient that diamond-shaped card. Just the fact that it's a diamond shaped card is cool. You know, the artwork, the visuals of everything just look beautiful on the table. I love the, you know, agonizing decisions of play a card, discard a card every time. That just gets crazy hard to figure out as the game builds and those cards become more and more important. I love the shared incentives on the board to build projects and heal houses. You know, you're just fighting for every type of point you can get because it's not a point salad game. And I just like that the, uh, the event cards sort of drive the game along and every time you play, it's gonna be different based on those events. And I can imagine if you've read these books, the events are gonna be very thematic. They have flavor text, which really adds a nice thematic element to a more mechanism-based Euro game. So I can appreciate that even having not read those books, I still feel like I'm in this game and what I'm doing is quite thematic. I have a lot of good things to say about this game and not a lot of bad things, so I'm just gonna stop rambling. Let me know in the comments below if you've ever played this and how you like it, or how you like any of these games in this Ken Follett trilogy of games. I actually like all three of these for different reasons, and maybe one day I'll do a video on the other ones as well. And as always, thank you so much for joining us on the Undiscovered Games video podcast. We really appreciate you watching and listening from wherever you are in the world. If you want to help the channel, you can click subscribe and share this video with your friends. There's also a donate link in the description if you wish to support us. Any proceeds go toward making more videos like this and just better quality content in the future. We really have a passion for finding these undiscovered games and sharing them with you. Also, we have an Instagram page. If you're not familiar with that, go give us a follow on the IG. We are at undiscovered underscore games. We post a lot of cool pictures and written reviews over there as well. So thanks again for watching and we will see you on the next one.